express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that he had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out-of-bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're going to make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19, but the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Child. It's a platform that God has given Samaritan's Purse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. During this pandemic, during all the fear that COVID-19 has brought to the world, this is when we go out and share the truth. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, going out in the heart of this darkness, the heart of this virus, to go out and to bring up hope of Jesus Christ around the world. Is there a sense of urgency? Yes, there is. Because there's kids out there without the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. Get out there to be a part of this. Right now, it's the time. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. What that video was about, if you got any part of it, it was about uh, the shoeboxes. And we have Courtney with us, and Courtney is overseeing this for the area. Is that a way to put it? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and Courtney's here to share. You can probably smell the soup. Uh, so, uh, Courtney, I'll let you just take the floor and explain what's going on today. There it is. Yeah. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are having a good morning and smelling all the soup. It is cooking. We have chicken noodle and chili, so I hope you guys all can stay. Um, if you guys haven't packed a shoebox before, I'll explain it a little bit. Um, from the video, you saw these green and red shoeboxes. And what that is, it's just a basic box, but it's filled with gifts, hygiene items, school supplies, and those boxes are going to kids all across the country, and some of these kids have never received a gift before. They haven't had a birthday gift or a Christmas gift, so this may be the first gift that they have ever received. But my favorite part about this ministry is that every single gift has the gospel taken with it. Every child that receives a gift gets to hear the gospel spoken to them, and they have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. They have the opportunity to come back for a 12-lesson program to be discipled and to become disciples and to tell their families, their community. So it's not just these kids that you're reaching, but it's also their families and their communities through these shoe boxes. Um, so if you'd like to get more involved, um, we do have information back at the table. Um, November 19th, we're going to be doing this the first time this year, we're going to be doing a church packing party. Um, our goal is around 100 boxes that night to pack. So all the donations that we've been getting throughout the year, those are going to be packed into shoe boxes. So we'd, we'd love it if you guys could join us. Um, today, the fundraiser, the money that's raised is actually going to be for shipping those boxes from the packing party. So that's what it's going to be used for. And um, if you guys have any other questions about packing shoe boxes and more information about the ministry, you can just come find me wherever I'm at. I'm usually running all over. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd love if you guys could all get involved, pray about whether you want to volunteer during collection week or whatever God's calling you to do through this ministry. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Man, she is awesome. I, I love the way she has stepped up into the ministry and is serving this way. And so... Uh, what a great opportunity to share the gospel. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to have you here. So good to be in the Lord's house. It is always so good to be in the Lord's house. Uh, just a, a few, uh, few
few quick announcements too. Also, tomorrow, uh, a new ministry is breaking out in, uh, or being a part of Celebrate Recovery. It is for kids. And uh, this, this is starting just grassroots. Teresa uh, has stepped up and wants to lead this. And we have about four volunteers, I think, right now that are going to step into the ministry. And this is so, actually, what will be happening at the, when CR is going through for the adults, the kids will be going through their own form of CR. And this is an incredible opportunity. We're working close with HHS and uh, we're in hopes of this really expanding. So anybody interested in jumping into helping out with this ministry, we'd love for you to, to let us know. It's every Monday night. And it'll be happening on this side of the, the complex. Uh, Challenge Center is where CR happens. So uh, it'll be a great opportunity. And uh, the small groups were excited. Actually, I had a couple people talk to me about wanting to start a small group for young adults. And I'm like, yes. This is awesome. And so uh, another one is kind of in the grass, uh, in the roots here, kind of coming together. So we're excited about that. And I just want to encourage you, uh, in between services or small groups, there's a lot of places that you can plug in. I love what's happening in that. And so uh, if you have more questions about that or anybody wants to step in and help, we would love for that to happen. Uh, I have just a, a short, quick presentation this morning. Uh, for those of you who know about the chil or the uh, preschool, we have a board that helps oversee the preschool. And uh, Mary Perney and, and Roger have been blessing us for lots of years since the beginning and have helped us so, so much with uh, this, this ministry. And we're so grateful. Uh, they, they have uh, finished their call in this part of particular ministry and have stepped away from this ministry. And we're so thankful for them. Also, Roger graciously gave me uh, the, what's left over of a barn and uh, providing these boxes. And so we're not having two dedications today. We do have a dedication today. Uh, Easton James is being dedicated today. Uh, but this particular box is for the Pernies. And we're so thankful for your help with the preschool. Uh, it has been just a blessing. And uh, also, Roger, this is also about some of the wood from your your family's barn, and so we're so thankful for that. We're just so thankful for all that you've done. Thank you. A couple of the deaconists came in today going, I didn't know we we're having two dedications. I got to get another Bible. And it's like, no, no, we're just having one. So again, thank you. Thank you. Lots of folks to pray for. Um, Jean, Jean Bose is uh, continuing to recover in Callaway in the nursing home. And uh, we're just praying that, that, that uh, for her, and uh, I know she had lots of appointments last week. I don't know how all those turned out. Also, I want, want you, if you would, just continue to pray for Dolores and uh, Ralph Reedy. Dolores has gotten out of the hospital, so I, I saw them Friday, and, and uh, they're doing pretty well. Uh, but Ralph made it very clear. First of all, he wanted to thank all of you for reaching out to them. Many of you have stopped by, sent cards we're so thankful for that and checking in on them. Uh, but Dolores' health has continued to be difficult. I mean, she's having difficulty walking. And, and so Ralph has asked if we could have, uh, so just to contact us if you can help out in their family. Uh, some of it is just some basic cleanup around their, their, uh, their property and um, future possibly mowing, but also just to check in on them on a regular basis. Uh, because it's really getting difficult for them just to take care of everything they need to. So if any of you would be called in that kind of ministry, we would love for you to step forward with us and help us to come alongside them. Also, I shared with you about Rose Conley. She'd been here before and gave testimony to Christ here. And uh, Rose uh, is recovering from surgery. She did have cancer. They removed the tumor. Uh, they believe they've gotten all the tumor. Uh, she'll be out of work until the 19th. And um, she's doing a little better. It's been a really difficult run. She's had some, some uh, problem, complications as a result of the surgery, but she's doing well. She's home, uh, but she so appreciates all of your prayers. And uh, Steve is with us and, and uh, his son. And, and Maddie, Maddie is continuing to, to, uh, to improve. In fact, this last week, she took her first step. Praise God, she took her first step. What a, what a miracle that is. Uh, she has not walked since the accident, obviously. She's, and she did have surgery this last week. And it was, uh, we believe from what I've gotten from Deb and Steve, that it was successful. 
Um, so they are so thankful for all your prayers are with us today, and we're going to continue to lift up your family. We're so uh, thankful for how God is working in your family, and just and Maddie possibly will be going to uh, rehab in Lincoln, possibly this week. As Steve said, we hope. We just kind of don't know one day to the next on that. And then Cora, um, uh, the family's here today. Cora is still in the in the hospital in, in uh, Lincoln. And they're, they're home, and, and we're so thankful that you are with us. Our prayers are with you. And uh, Cora has continued to struggle, continued to struggle. It's kind of an up and down, one day at a time kind of thing for this family. And so um, make sure you touch base with them today. They, uh, they're here with us this morning, and, and it's just been so difficult, all that they're going through, all they're going through. Uh, so let, let's just join in prayer, shall we? Father, I just thank you for your hand your hand over each family, baby Cora. Lord, we, are, we just cry out to you for her, uh, for Rebecca and Bryce and Weston. I just pray for them. I ask, Lord, that you just comfort them. Lord, I thank you for how you are speaking to them each morning and thankful for each morning they have with baby Cora. And for uh, all the others too, Lord, I, I think of Cody having some improvements this last week as well. And Lord, there are so many that, that I didn't mention as well, and we just lift them up to you. Lord, you, you tell us that uh, we are to be faithful about praying, and I, I pray for each. And Lord, I pray that if there are things that you have for us to do that can come alongside to ease their day, whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that you put that on our hearts. Lord, I thank you for the many ways that you pour through this body how you nudge so many in this body to step out and to minister to others in this community. And Lord, I, I thank you for the way that you are healing, that you're bringing your healing grace. And this morning, I pray that you open our hearts. You open our hearts to really see what that grace is, that truth is. I, I pray now that you just fill us with the spirit of bringing praise to your name and glory to your name. I pray this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we worship our Savior? <clears throat>
So from my devotional this morning, Psalms 104 offers a litany of praise to God for things we easily overlook. God makes springs pour water into the ravines, sang the poet. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate. Even that the night is seen as good and fitting. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. But then the sun rises. People go out to their work, to their labor until evening. For all these things, the psalmist concluded, I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. In a world that doesn't know how to deal with death or the pain of sin, even the smallest offering of praise to our Creator can become a shining contrast of hope.
Father, that's our, our prayer this morning. We thank you that you bring us to the cross. You remind us to remember. Lord, I, I, I pray that you just speak to our hearts today as only you can. I just pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's a blessing in the body. I, I, I love this. It's almost every week. This is great. Let's keep it up. Um, we get to have another baby dedication, and this morning is uh, 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 that opportunity that we get to have as well. And we remind you that uh, baby dedications are really for the parents. And uh, for, or in this case, Jessica and family, they are uh, dedicating Easton James this morning. And uh, it's such a blessing. That I, I think they just slipped out, did they not? Uh, oh, there we go. We'll find him. We'll find him. We haven't lost Easton. I have a few things to say. If you remember about dedication, uh, the Lord Jesus was brought the eighth day uh, to dedicate to get, dedicate him at the, at the temple. And we know that Hannah as well brought Samuel and dedicated him to the Lord. And this is, this is really for us as parents. It's also for the church family. And uh, we're still looking for Easton where he lost the... <laughs> so we'll... <laughs> They'll be coming here shortly. <laughs> and by the way, the faith boxes, uh, we make those for the families. Uh, that is to put all your records in and also the Bibles that have worn out, that we wore them out uh, throughout the years. I think this is one of the blessings I know in our faith box. There he comes. Come on up, guys. There we come. There we come. Oh, he lost his socks. That's awesome. He is... I, I got to hold him this morning. He's a blessing. This is Easton James and Jessica and Carol and Jim and family. This, this is such a, such a blessing that we get to be a part of this with you. And I know this is, you've been in a lot of prayer over the, the weeks and months coming up to this date. And we're so thankful, so thankful how you've loved this little guy. And this guy loves you so much and has blessed your home, blessed your home. Yes. So as a church family, would you please stand? Uh, I want to ask you, you, you know, this is, this is all of us together, that we come alongside families. We come alongside and, and help them, and whether it's in VBS or Awanas or, or on a Sunday afternoon or, or, or maybe just some babysitting or, or, or a word of kindness along the way. Will you as a church family come alongside Jessica and family to help raise little Easton? If so, answer, we will. We will. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I know, Jessica, I, I know your testimony. I know it well. And I know your family's testimony as well. Uh, will you commit to raising this, this beautiful, precious boy all the days that you have to the glory and to the love of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will. I will. I will. Awesome. Jim, I think you have a verse or two, right? Let me get you a mic. There you go. Psalms 139, 13 through 16. <clears throat> for you formed me, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me with my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you <clears throat> when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet formed, and yet, and in your book they are written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing Grandpa gets to do that, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, Easton, let's try this one more time, huh? Hey, there's a smile. There's a smile. As long as we got that binky going, there we go. Yeah, I want you to come over and say hello to all these people over here. Do you see all these funny-looking people over here? Yes, sirree. What a, oh, deepest blue eyes. So beautiful. And I, you know, I, I know through the, uh, the months, just you've grown so much, Jessica, and we praise God for that. And so let's, let's dedicate him. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we just thank you for this precious little boy. How precious. Lord, we thank you for his health. 
We thank you for how he's growing. We thank you for the home he's growing up in and that they're pointing him to you. This morning, we, we just, Lord, we mark this time that we dedicate him to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Oh, he agrees. He agrees. How precious. Thank you. Now, yeah, this is your box here. And also uh, from, from the deaconesses, is uh, their first Bible. Got his name in it and everything. And a little card commemorating the day. Also, a letter from me to be opened on his 12th birthday. And so this is on your 12th birthday. You get up, make sure mom doesn't open it before then, okay? Okay. Praise God. Let's give a praise to the Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, what a treasure. What a treasure. It's time for Children's Church. If we haven't got our kids off to Children's Church, I see some have already gone, but it, uh, we can send them off to Children's Church. Uh, before we dive into the scriptures for this morning in Daniel, uh, we're in the middle part of chapter 5 today. Before I dive into this, though, I, you know, as we were singing about the wondrous cross, and I, I pray your hearts are preparing for communion. That uh, I trust that if you've gotten a cup, if not, just we'll, we'll, at the time when we, we uh, break bread and, and open the cup, that uh, we'll make sure that everyone gets one who would like to have one. But as we approach this, you know, when I first came to this church, this is one of the things I, I looked around and I thought, we have to have crosses in every room. And I love that if you remember back when we asked, I said, okay, if you have, you know, make a cross. And I remember Sally made the cross in this room. I think it's right here. Ray made one down in the other room. And, and I, I know Jerry Johnson made one out of eggshells, I think. It's in the, the, the conference room here. And uh, I, I know Larry is brought us and blessed us with this particular cross. And I love crosses. It's, all, it's in our house, almost every room. I know almost every room has a cross. Uh, Larry said, there's something wrong with you. You're just crazy about the crosses. And as I know, I, I love seeing this because it's a reminder, reminder of the redemption, reminder of the, the being humbled. And I pray this morning as you hear this message that, that you approach this and start thinking about all the ways that God has humbled you to bring you to a point to understand and receive this moment when Jesus was first on the cross, the very first words that he said, Daddy, forgive them. You know, that humility that is necessary to come to the cross that humility that comes that I know that I need it. I remember, you know, before I was a Christian, I was like, I don't get it. But then when I became a Christian and God opened my eyes and humbled me, that it broke my heart to realize that I put him there. The things that I rebelled against him, I put him there. I was part of it. And yet he forgave me. And he forgives you. I pray we begin there this morning. Because you know what's remarkable about the book of Daniel? Is that Daniel pointed Nebuchadnezzar day after day after day. 70 years that he, he, was, he was in captivity in Babylon. That he was consistent and he never missed the opportunity to point to the grace of God. The grace of, he spoke the truth and love and the grace of God and pointing him, pointing Nebuchadnezzar to this grace. And as you'll see in a moment, as we finish up chapter four, you're going to see the very last passage of chapter four in Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar cries out to the Most High, calling him the God of all and honors him. And it was because a faithful man spoke the grace of Jesus Christ all the way through. I pray this morning that, that you come to understand what it means to stand in the grace. If you'll stand with me and join me in Daniel chapter 5, 17 through 23. Travis was going to read today, but he was with his family. His Shelby's great-grandmother passed away and could not be with us today. So, Daniel chapter 5, 17 through 23. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, 
Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kinship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. Whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with wild donkeys and he was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hands is your breath and whose all your ways you have not honored. Father, I pray your gracious heart speaks to us today in a way that we can hear and understand. Humble and praising you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You now, I've titled this whole series through Daniel is to live ready. And, and uh, faith enduring through adversity. And, you know, I've had several people say to me that, you know, uh, probably a year ago, if we were to go through Daniel, it would not have been as impactful as it is now. Because now we're starting to see the adversity around us that is so, so overwhelming us. And, it, and it's speaking to us. And I praise God for that. The timing of it has been all God's hand. But I want you to understand, because Daniel is speaking now to Belshazzar before he interprets the writing on the wall. When God wrote, sent the hand and wrote on the wall, and we'll deal with that next week. But I want you to see something in this, because, you know, does you understand what it means to really stand in the grace of God and walk in the grace of God? Do, do you uh, grab a hold of this and do you understand what it means that we are blessed with this as a Christian to walk in the grace of God and see it? And, 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 and this grace of God is all the way through Daniel. If you have Daniel open again, turn to the end of chapter 4 and you're going to see some beautiful, beautiful tracing of God's grace to Nebuchadnezzar. In 34, he says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, and you see this profession of his wanting to follow God and surrendering his whole life to him. Nebuchadnezzar could not break free from his madness until God appointed the time. Then he had the opportunity to humble himself and lift his eyes to the Lord and to heaven. I want you to understand something about humility. Bob brought me this article from the Reform Group, and it really made sense. It's something that I've been trying to say for some time. And, and, and humility, you cannot humble yourself. Humility is, is something we, is not something we achieve. We cannot. How many of you ever coached and told some kid, you know, you need, you need some humble pie, dude. You know, probably some of us have said that, but the reality is it's not going to happen. We can't humble anybody. It is our response to things that God has laid before us that we respond either in pride or in humility. Humble is not something that we initiate. We don't initiate it. It's something that we receive. It is not an achievement. It is not fundamentally a human initiative. I, I can't initiate it. It is not something we just all wake up and go, I think I need to be humble today. It doesn't work that way. We either receive it or we resist it or rebel against it. Nebuchadnezzar said, my reasoning returned to me after the seven years. 
Nebuchadnezzar at first bowed up and bowed his neck against it and resisted the opportunity to be humble. We saw it over and over and over. Whether it be the first interpretation of the dream or whether it was after the furnace or after the second interpretation. And then he goes off and he says, hey, look at everything I've created. The next thing you know, God turned him loose in the wild and lived like an ox. But then at the end of that seven years, at the appointed time, Nebuchadnezzar bowed down in humility. He received it. He says, I bless the Most High, praised and honored him, lives forever. For his dominion, I'm in the end of chapter 4, verse 34, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures for generation to generation, including our generation now. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And, not, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of the kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right. All his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar could see the truth only about himself when he saw the truth about God. That's true of us. Let me say that again. You can only see the truth about yourself when you see the truth of God. As we come to the cross, you see the truth of yourself in humility. And after this, his reasoning returned. And it resulted in prayer. As you see at the close of Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. And, and we, we will know that God can change the heart of a man. And it's amazing when we see it. He can change the course of rivers. He can change the, the oceans, the distribution of resources, the assignment of angels. Spurgeon suggested the proper response of the believer to the greatness and the sovereignty of God is have a heart of humble, humble adoration and show a, a heart of unquestioning acceptance of what he has done and doing. Exercise the spirit of reverent love to him and let your spirit have profound delight in him and him alone. You know, there have been many that have been raised up from humble origins to great glory and then we see them fall, haven't we? It is out throughout our life that we are to walk in this humility as he humbles us and receive it and to walk in it. And also one of the things about a nation, and let me just take a side note about this, because since Babylon is, is used in Scripture as a figure of the world system in general, we can say Nebuchadnezzar's madness foreshadows the madness of Gentile nations in their rejection of God. That we can see the foreshadowing of a nation that rejects God, what's going to come. And we can see what's happening in our own nation. We can see it. Nebuchadnezzar's fall typifies Jesus' judgment of the nations, as well as we'll see in down the road as we get into the later prophecies of 7, 8, and 9, that Nebuchadnezzar's restoration foreshadows the restoring of some nations. But I want us to look at this one piece this morning and dive into this, as Daniel's example is about standing in the true grace of God. I don't know if you've ever looked at Daniel from this perspective because here Daniel, in the, in the love of his heavenly father, pointed Nebuchadnezzar day after day after day in truth and in grace and pointed him to this loving truth of who God is. In, in Daniel 5, 18 through 21, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father's kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. How many times we see that, that Daniel spoke that, Nebuchadnezzar, this isn't anything you've done, and do not take praise for yourself. This is all God. 
And it is so important we understand this, that the position wherever you are in life is that God has given you what it is that you have. And we see this also written into the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. In this letter, you'll see this is the one single reason that this letter was written. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. And one of the things about Asia Minor that, that Peter is writing in is Asia Minor was, talk about rough. They hated Christians and they would kill them and treat them almost like rodents. In some of their historical documents, a Christian didn't even get a trial. They killed them just like a rodent. An Ammonite or a, a Mennonite or whatever the different tribes would come through, they would get a trial, but a Christian would not get a trial. In 1 Peter 5.12, it says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you. Look at this now. Exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God Stand firm in it. This is the true grace of God. This battle that you're facing, the adversity that's coming on to you, the persecution that's coming to you, the battle that's going on right now in our nation, we are to stand in this true grace of God. And what a picture that we can look now at Daniel of how to do that. Because Daniel, 70 years of captivity, faithfully, continually pointed the leaders ones that were holding him in, in captivity, pointing them to the grace of God all the way through. We see the blessing that came when Nebuchadnezzar understood it. See, Daniel explained this humility all the way through the picture here in Daniel. He told him, he told him in the truth, but always never to destroy him, but to point him to the grace of God. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. God didn't kill Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't destroy him, but he kept him alive. He says as much in Daniel chapter 5. He kept him alive. How many of you have ever thought about it? I looked at my own life, and it's like, by the grace of God, he kept me alive. By the grace of God, he kept me alive. Nothing of my doing. He saved me through it. He saved me through it. And I pray that you stop and you look at your own life and how he protected you time and time again. He guarded over your soul until just the right time that you would know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that he guarded over this. This is what was happening with Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the, the cry of Peter of the time in Asia Minor. This is the true grace of God. It is true of our time. This is the true grace of God. How are you standing in it? Do you notice something that Daniel even prayed for it? Daniel prayed for God's mercy and his grace, his mercy to come to him. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 18, it says, and he told them, this is right before the fiery furnace. Or actually, it's right after the, the first dream interpretation. It's in chapter 2. God had not revealed the, what the dream was, nor the interpretation. Daniel immediately goes to the three men and he goes, hey, would you pray with them? And this is what he tells them. He says, and he told them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And I, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this in my own life. Have I prayed for the grace have I prayed for his mercy to guard over me all the steps that I have? How many of us ever stop and think about, Lord, pray over, I pray your mercy about whether it's economically or whether it's with my family or with it. Pray for his grace. Listen to this history now through Daniel, if you will, about the grace. Daniel knew the grace of the Most High. He, he not only exhorted Nebuchadnezzar to know this, and he lived it. He lived in this grace. Daniel patiently waits upon the God of heaven, who is the only one who can show and give mercy. And look with me now through this history. Daniel lived in the mercy of God in captivity. 17, we think, 17 years old, and he's in captivity. And he's praying for the grace of God. Daniel did not compromise who he was. 
We see Titus writing about this in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It is the grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And that's what he did. Daniel faced death in the grace of God, as we just read. Daniel encouraged his friends to face the furnace in truth and grace. And they did. Daniel trusted God to know the dreams and the prophecy of the end times. And he did. And he wrote it. Daniel in the mercy loved God so much that he got another dream of what Nebuchadnezzar was going to face for seven years. And he spoke it. Daniel faithfully encouraged Nebuchadnezzar to seek the Most High, even with this endless prideful failure that he watched in Nebuchadnezzar over and over and over. Daniel spoke the truth to an arrogant, even more arrogant man than Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Belshazzar. And he spoke honestly and clearly of the judgment that was coming to him. And I ask you this question. Have you prayed for the mercy of God to be with you and what you're facing? Have you prayed specifically that the mercy of God will be revealed to you? Or about those that may be causing difficulty in your life? Because here's the reality. Either you live in the true grace of God, or you live in the arrogance of yourself. You live in destroying others. You live in negligence. Remember, Jesus came in truth. First of all, he came in truth and grace. This is in John 1, 14, 1, 17. He came in truth and grace. Not truth, then grace. Truth and grace. If you remember in John 18, he tells us this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So one of the things that we must get ourselves prepared for and understanding is the truth. I, I need to understand what's in God's word, what he's called me to. You know, as a dad, when I didn't know Christ, I, I was negligent in leading my family. As I came to know Christ, it was my responsibility to come to know what his teachings are so I could pass them on to my family, that I would teach them the truth. But even more than that, walking in this grace, do I understand what it means to really stand in this grace as we've seen in Daniel's life? And I want a contrast of destroying and restoring. Because a Christian who walks in the grace is all about restoring. A person who is in legalism or religion is about destroying. Chuck Swindoll said the greatest enemy of the church today is legalism. And I pray this morning you see the contrast between the two. Because what we see in Daniel was consistently teaching all the way, pointing to the grace. Speak the truth, but the grace of God. Do you understand the mercy of God? In Daniel 5, 21 through 23, and he was driven among the children of mankind. He explained the truth of what happened to him. Daniel was faithful in praying for the mercy of God, of heaven. Daniel did not waver from this truth. Daniel longed for Nebuchadnezzar to know God. He pointed and protected Nebuchadnezzar. Even to the point of Nebuchadnezzar, that when he was in the in the wild with the beast for those seven years, who took care of the kingdom? Most believe that it was Daniel protected it. He gave steps, he lived it out that Nebuchadnezzar would come to know the grace of God. Everything Daniel did for Nebuchadnezzar was to point him to the restoration. There is not one statement in Daniel about destroying Nebuchadnezzar. Not one and see, this is the call of us as a Christian. If you have your Bibles, join me in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Because this is what we're called to as a Christian. See, see, when troubles come to us as a Christian, you know, our brothers and sisters should rally around us in grace and truth. That there should be this coming alongside, not kicking them out, but coming alongside. 
Galatians 6.1 says it very clearly. Paul writes it. He says, hey, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, kindness. Keep watch on yourself. And I know I've watched and walked with many of you doing that. And I praise God for those opportunities because it's a blessing to come alongside those. And I know this is for believers, but it appears Nebuchadnezzar became a follower of God most high. Now contrast that with what happens with legalism and religion. If you have your Bibles, join me in Matthew chapter, chapter 12. This story is also found in Mark chapter 3 and Luke chapter 6. But we see this contrast, and I, I pray you see, because I, I hope you're catching, staying with me here, that Daniel, he continued to point to the grace, spoke the truth, continued to encourage, received the humility. And we see that at the end of that time, Nebuchadnezzar did. But in Matthew chapter 12, read with me here now, chapter 12, verse 9. Jesus is going from synagogue to synagogue. And he went on from there and he entered the, their synagogue and a, a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. Do you notice that? So they might accuse him. Have you ever noticed that people, when they come into some, some places, they look for what's wrong? And like ever, you know, and some people almost wear this, well, I'm just a critic. What a badge. I'm not sure I would say that too loud. Even we see that within the church. So some come walking in and going, Let me, I'm looking for what's wrong. That's exactly what these guys were doing. They came in and they said, so they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you has a sheep, if it is into, falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? More than likely that most of these guys had done that. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. I want you to take a really close look at verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. See, the religious were there going to, I'm going to look for how do I destroy this guy? How do I absolutely run him out? How, how, do I, how do I run him away? I want you to listen to this story. When I was working with the health system, one of my responsibilities, this was 20 years ago, when, when at Good Samaritan, we were moving from a two north surgical unit to PCU. PCU is a progressive care unit. It's a step down from ICU. It was necessary to have, have this PCU for good health care. And, and one nurse, there was about 45 nurses in this group, and this nurse and I was working with the team as we were making this transition. And this nurse was incredible. Her patient care, her staff relationships, she was, she was awesome. We watched it over two years. She was absolutely loved by everyone, the doctors included. Coworkers and patients and families wrote about her all the time and saying how awesome she was to serve with, how awesome she was with her care. She saw the good in others. Patients, when others, that she was patient and kind when others failed. She never spoke ill of others and seldom fallen into to the work politics of which we know exists in every workplace, right? And she was very clear on her call. So as the world does, we, we promoted her, right? We said, man, this is an awesome nurse. She told us later, you promoted to me to my incompetence. After six months of being a manager on the floor, her resignation letter read this way, I become evil. I, I come into the unit and I see always what's wrong. I see every spot, every, every broken thing. I see patients as whining hypochondriacs. 
I think all my ways are right and everyone else is wrong. I could care less what others are facing. Her final note was, I had no interest in others' healing. I just wanted them out of my way. That was her resignation. It happens to every one of us, isn't it? How easy we can fall to a critical eye. I'm saying this on a Sunday after the Husker game, right? How quickly we do this, and it's destroying people. It's destroying. I, I praise God for this church, and I praise God for the grace-filled way that so many in this body do the work of the king. I praise God that I get to serve in a body that serves in this way because it's in the lights of God's mercy to show yourself merciful. This is what we're called to live out. See, legalism never points to grace and the mercy of God because they do not know God. They do not know the true grace of God and they are not standing in it. They do not know because they are in the flesh and not in the spirit of God. Because when the Spirit of God and the grace of God comes, it's about restoring, not destroying. And we see this through Daniel. How many of us would have looked at Nebuchadnezzar, I being probably the first in line to go, this guy was a creep. He was disgusting. But Daniel, in the faith, in the truth of the Most High, told him the truth but also stood in the grace. They stood in the grace. See, back to the story of Jesus, the religious leaders watched Jesus closely, but they had no heart of love for him. They knew about Jesus, but they did not know him nor love him. Mark 3, 1, 3, 5 actually is one verse that jumps out, same story, and it reads this way, and he looked around at them with anger and grieved at the hardness of their heart. And they said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it, and he healed him. This is one of the few places in Scripture that we see Jesus described as having anger, and was angry at the hardness of men's hearts. Jesus was angry because this was a perfect opportunity for the critics of his to change their minds and to humble themselves before him but they refused to change their minds and rejected Jesus. And I want to ask you just a simple question. To stand in the grace of God, are you about the restoration in the mercy of God? Or have you been caught up and destroyed? Because this faith in the mercy of God, we see it all the way through this, this passage, these passages. In Matthew, or Daniel, chapter 5, 21, and we see Nebuchadnezzar was, was, was seven years like an animal until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it in whom he will. We know that Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9 tells us this, is that for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. See, all about church, in fact, this is going to be the focus of the Christmas messages, this hope, peace, joy, the love of God in Jesus Christ, is, that, is, is this grace motivated, this grace that we stand in. It is always about restoring. It's always about pointing to the one who has life. It's never about destroying. And God alone has the right to give life and to take it. God alone has the right to put an end to a power of a nation and to empower a nation. And I, one more thing that I want you to see in this text is the idols. And, and that challenges whether we're going to walk in the grace or not. Is the, idol, the world's idols are empty and powerless, and I pray we know that. Daniel 5.23, it lays it out. He says, but you have lifted up yourself. This is Belshazzar. You lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. 
and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk from the wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold, and bronze, and iron, wood, and stone, which you do not see or hear. But the God in whose hand is your breath. Did you notice that? The breath you just finished was the grace of God. Every breath I have, every breath I receive is by the grace of God. And whose all your ways have not been, you have not honored him. Belshazzar was filled with vile pursuing of idols, worshiping things that have no power. And I want to challenge us as Americans because we must be careful of something here. Because the West, we are tempted to believe and idolize freedom and democracy. And I, I, I may be stepping on, whoa, wait a minute, Peterson, this is a little way second. See, if these virtues had the power within themselves to transform the world, Belshazzar's idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone, they remember, have no power. Only God Most High has the power to raise a nation and to bring a nation down. And as Christians, we must understand that. See, all of us, to some extent, are functional Belshazzars. Every one of us. I don't know about you. <laughs> I got to tell you, preaching through Daniel has been very convicting. My wife says, you seem kind of distant sometimes. Well, because I'm getting the tar beat out of me here. <laughs> Convicted. Because this is what it speaks to me. I have to admit that I'm more like Belshazzar than I care to admit. Probably all of us in here about Noah Wana verses. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has rebelled. Every one of us has failed. And Jesus told us there's only one place for us to stand in this grace is repentant. Luke chapter 13, repent, repent, repent. Like I said, I confess I'm more like Belshazzar than I care to admit. Because God's sovereignty is in the salvation. And I pray as we approach the moment of taking communion together, that we stop and we understand that this sovereignty that God has given us is that, but God in whose hand your breath and who all your life is. As we began today, let me remind you that humility is not something we achieve. We cannot. It is a response to the things that God has brought us to. And if you feel any pressure about conviction here, humbling, it is God's movement in your heart. It is your response to these things that he's laid before you that you can either choose to be prideful and ignore or come in humility and confess. Remember, humble is something we receive. It is not something we achieve. It is not fundamentally a human initiative. It is not something we just up and do one day. It is something that God has brought to our feet that we humbly come before him because God humbles. In Daniel 5, 21, we see at the end there, it says, until he knew that the most high was God because God is the one that brings this. And we can choose rebellion in response to this like in Daniel 5, 22 and 23, that we see Belshazzar did it in rebellion. See, rebellion is responding against God, what he's shown you. And it is, and we are without excuse, as we know in Romans 1. We can rebel or we can respond repentant until he knew that God was most high. And I pray that is your position right now because it comes to this redemption of what we sang about in the worship this morning. The cross, oh, the wonderful cross. Spurgeon wrote this. I love what he said. He says, we do not worship enough. Even in our public gatherings, we do not have enough worship. Worship the king. Bow your heads. Bow your spirits. Adore him and live the one who lives forever and ever. Your thoughts, your emotions, yes, everything that you have, bring before him. Worship him with the lowest, with deep reverence for him because he is the all in all. Let redemption reign in you. 
your eyes, if your eyes have been opened by God's grace, then you see the emptiness of the things that you probably have followed. And I don't know about you, but I wonder this sometimes in my own life. I cannot believe he chose me. I am so undeserving. And it blows me away, the passage, when I, when, I, when I think of it in John chapter 15, verse 16, that Jesus chose you. You did not choose him. He chose you. And, and I, I see the many that are around me that are so much smarter, so much better than me. And it blows me away that he chose me. It humbles me. And who am I that I can know such goodness of Christ? So now as we prepare our hearts to come before him, so where are your eyes? You know, as your heart set on the invitation of Belshazzar's feast, are you hoping for your goodness being enough? Or is your heart set on the banquet of Christ where the humble gather? And, and I pray as you take the cup and by the way, if there's any who need a cup, if you just raise your hand, Jerry, if you would help. If there's any who need a cup, just raise your hand. Jerry will bring you some. The, the, the cup, the, the, the table is open to all. The table is open to all who have confessed Christ. And I, and I pray that you understand what that means, that you know that you've heard your own voice say, the Lord Jesus is my King. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I accept you as Lord of my life. I cry out to you that you will fill me. If you haven't heard your voice say that, I pray that you say it now to yourself. I pray that if there's things that you have, you have been more about destroying than restoring, that, that this is the time that we bring them before God and we say, Lord, please forgive me. Because I want to stand in your grace. I want to live in this grace. I don't want to just read about it. I just want to talk about it on Sunday. I want to live it. I want to live it in the relationships that are the most challenging in your life, Lord. I want to live this grace out. I want to remind you that if you've not confessed Christ to take the bread and the cup without confessing him as Lord and Savior is to take it inappropriately and it brings judgment on your head. But I pray and I want to give you just a moment just to come before him and humble yourself before him. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we can come before you. We can hear your word. You tell us in your word that those who, who are your disciples abide in your word. Take it to heart. Lord, forgive us We're trying to do things on our own. Forgive us of seeing those humbling moments and pridefully just walking away from them. Lord, I pray you bring us back to those moments, the things you want us to see, to know. And I pray you give us the courage to receive the message and humble ourselves and receive it. Lord, on the night that before you were crucified, you took the bread and looked at each one of them just as you're looking at us now. So this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of it, remember, remember. Eat this in remembrance of me, he said. Let's partake together. Same manner he took the cup.
he held it in his hand and he looked at them again and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. Every time you drink of it, remember, he said. Drink this in remembrance of me, he said. Let's partake together. thank you for your word. I pray it goes out. Not mine. Yours. Lord, I pray you help us to live a life that we we see those moments that you're humbling us and receive them. We give us the courage, Lord, to stand in the grace every day. Lord, I I pray the fellowship now that's going to follow with the soup and the time together that you bless this time. We love you, Lord, and Jesus, I pray. Amen. Enjoy his grace today.